Alan. I have to ask Alan. The host. Mm-hmm. With, with respect to motor carriers, um, mm-hmm. driving is a really tough job. Mm-hmm. And, and where where does the focus on trying to enhance uh, the workplace of the driver become a, a motivating factor for doing some of these things? Uh, just, I can't see how a person for 10 hours sits there. Mm-hmm. Monitoring, this. right. And, and, and it's almost an OSHA thing, but you are OSHA for the driver community. When, when does that become more of a, a discussion? It doesn't seem to be discussed very much. Well, it so is. Just it, to, to summarize, the health and safety of commercial drivers you asked right. about, Alan. Yeah. And I, I would agree with you. This is driving uh, is a. Uh, uh, commercial driving is a difficult job. It always has been, um, and uh, it, it gets more, more and more complicated every year. You know, we do have a driver uh, shortage, I guess, because uh, the, the industry keeps saying that there's a driver shortage, but we have some other complications there. Drivers sometimes, they're on duty and go to make their pickup of whatever they're, they've been uh, retained to go uh, pick up, and there's, they have to sit and wait for hours, sometimes hours and hours. So that's a, that's... That's not just almost an abuse of the driver. That's, uh, I think it is an abuse of the driver, but it's also a, um, a, a tremendous inefficiency for an economy when we're saying we have a driver shortage. Well, maybe we do, maybe we don't. Why are these drivers sitting at a shipping location and being made to wait for, I've heard horror stories, of, of uh, six hours? Uh, so, no, we do, we do some, uh, people are allowed, uh, drivers are allowed to report through us, through our website, fmcsa.dot.gov, um, and we are, we need more input because we do have some enforcement authority in that respect. What I, what I have seen, in, and you know, it's such a um, segmented industry uh, in driving, um, in commercial, commercial motor vehicles, uh, the high-end uh, uh, carriers, really have fantastic equipment. They have all, this, all the bells and whistles when it comes to safety and all the, um, all the uh, uh, comforts that you would provide. That certainly makes it easier for uh, a driver, a long haul driver. Uh, but I'm not sure what makes it easier for a driver that has to get through New York City at five o'clock. You know, that's, I, I, I don't know. It's, it is, some part of this job is always gonna be there. That's that difficult. Um, just to follow up on that, what what kind of monitoring might you envision for for commercial drivers with these new systems? Well, it's not what I, I envision, and I'm certainly not putting out any mandates just for any press in the room. <laughs> okay, I'm dealing with enough right now. Um, the uh, but no, the, I, when you look at at some of the best pra- some of the practices. Uh, where in companies that have adopted, you know, a real culture of safety, um, where they they are monitoring, you know, lane departure, uh, they monitor, they can monitor that, they can monitor braking, uh, hard braking, they can monitor, you know, what what the driver is doing. Now that is somewhat intrusive, in fairness, uh, and some drivers don't like that, and others say I'm okay with it. I work for a company that values safety and values my safety as well as everybody else on the road. Uh, I know companies that have taken out their sleeper cabs that, because they want their drivers to get off the road at a certain point and, and, uh, and go to uh, get a proper rest at a hotel. Now, those aren't things that the government necessarily needs to mandate. That's something that companies can evaluate within their own business and say, this is what, for our business, this is what we see that we need to apply to to make our drivers safer and our drivers happier. Yeah, it's a striking contrast between the commercial and the non-commercial domains in terms of, of the kind of monitoring that takes place. Yeah, but I, I think that there is some, some innovation happening in, in, in that space. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, if you look at what the administrator said, like it's, more, it's even a step further than just monitoring, right? Like, typically that driver will either get a phone call at their next stop. Mm-hmm. Like, there's a, a manager who's actually, like, looking at that data um, and making certain judgment calls and kind of, getting on the driver about it either right away, mm-hmm. like literally like, hey, we just saw you did a really hard maneuver, like what, the, what was that all about? Or when they get back to the, to the depot, wherever they're off, they whatever, they get a little 
talking to. You see it on the light vehicle side with the insurance companies through the dongles trying to encourage mm -hmm. people, you know, here, plug this dongle in, which has cybersecurity issues that we're trying to work through. But nevertheless, that data is fed back to them and there's sort of the emails you get about what's going on with your driving behavior. You see companies doing that um, with, with teen keys and things like that, same sort of concept, right? Giving mm -hmm. feedback. So again, so the question is about monitoring. Um, I, I think it's not just monitoring. There's probably other pieces so to it. Street, yeah. Yeah, and I, uh, you know, I would add to what Nat said about that monitoring piece because we hear quite often about the privacy concerns. Um, in California, we just concluded a uh, a pilot for um, potentially paying per mile to to address this vehicle miles traveled situation, and that pilot involved five thousand people, and they were all volunteers. We all signed up. I signed up, and you had an option to uh, to determine. Um, how your miles were being tracked. And it could be the old-fashioned paper self-reporting type of thing all the way up to this dongle that you put in uh, and it would monitor exactly where you are. The vast majority of the people <laughs> chose that dongle. I did. I put that thing in my Ford F-150. It knew exactly where I was at all times and I didn't care. And um, so I think a lot of the privacy uh, concerns, I mean, you hear them, but I, you know, it could be in the end some people are more than happy to to give up that um, that sense of privacy for a, for a greater good. There was, a, I'll share this story, there's a negative effect that also happened with the pilot. As part of knowing exactly where I was, it also gamified it. So I, I'd get a score on what my driving was, mm -hmm. you know, based on hard braking, acceleration, speed. And um, it also would tell me on my phone, it would tell me if I only drove half a mile. It would scold me. It'd say, you only drove half a mile. Why'd you drive? You could have walked. And so at my house, my Ford F-150, the mirrors are too wide to fit in the garage. So when I get home, I park on the street. And then later that night, I fold the mirrors in and I pull it in the garage. And this thing would scold me. <laughs> so it got to the point where at night, instead of just going from the street into my garage, I'd drive around for a little bit and then go into the garage because I didn't want this thing scolding me. <laughs> so it had this <coughs> negative effect. <laughs> Thank you for being willing to admit that. <laughs> so imagine hypothetically that, that a company, you know, let's, let's call them Gesla, um, Theoretically, um, <laughs> we're, we're to call up the DMV and say, hey, we just thought you should know that there are these California drivers who don't seem to be paying attention to the road when they should be. Um, <laughs> could DMV act on that? Would you say thank you? What would be your response? Well, you know, it's, a, it's the same issue as, as we have now when people are mm -hmm. reporting bad drivers, right? Mm -hmm. And it's um, when it comes to vehicles, it's a, it's a similar situation about determining whether or not an individual vehicle has a, a problem or whether or not the fleet of vehicles have a problem. And if it is the fleet, then that's something that NHTSA will have to deal with. Mm -hmm. But there's got to be that feedback loop so that NHTSA is aware that there's an issue. Yeah. Uh, the way it happens now, and you know, Nat can speak more clearly about it, but you know, typically they get notified through um, voluntary uh, notifications mm -hmm. or dealerships notice a, mm -hmm. a plethora of vehicles being brought in for a very similar problem, and so it needs to be reported to but NHTSA. But what about the user? So uh, you know, an auto manufacturer or an insurer says, Right now, we know of these 100 drivers on your roads who are not looking on the road. Right. Could you so do anything with that? It's, it, like I said, it's, mm -hmm. it's something that we, we deal with now where yeah. an individual mm -hmm. is not obeying the, the rules of the road. He or she gets ticketed. We take action, right? Mm -hmm. And so that, uh, that same type of situation um, occurs now where if we are told that there is a vehicle that is not operating appropriately, mm -hmm we'll be able to look more deeply into what is the, the, the um, issue. Is it a, a dirty sensor or something like that for an individual vehicle and whether or not that translate to, translates to an entire fleet? Interesting. Yes.